It is my honor now to welcome someone that we wanted to have on this get together for a long, long time. The uh, state uh, labor commissioner is here. And I got to tell you, Leslie Osborne, I am so proud to finally see your smiling face. Well, thank you for inviting me. It's good to, uh, to be invited. There are several things I want to talk to you about. But first, what about, uh, let's, let's just jump ahead, if you don't mind. What about the recent uh, high court ruling on COVID mandates for companies? They came down with a pretty stringent ruling as of late. How's that going to affect Oklahoma? Well, I think that, you know, obviously the calls we were getting from most people being a very red state is that the, the vast majority of citizens and employees, uh, as well as business owners we heard of, really were not happy with those mandates. Uh, so we've had quite a few calls about that. But as you know, there's a big difference in the Federal Department of Labor and the State Department of Labor. So none of that rulemaking through OSHA or any of those uh, potential mandates would have ever been through the State Department of Labor and not even for enforcement. Uh, we do have a division that uh, works on safety programs to ensure that people in Oklahoma have safe mm -hmm. workplaces. And we call it, it's our SHARP certification, but we do have OSHA trained consultants that will go out to any small business, 500 people and below, and draw them a safety plan, implement it, and make sure they're OSHA compliant, which is, of course, the Federal Department of Labor. So, um, we heard about it like everyone else because it's not something that we had requested or something that we would be implementing. But uh, there are still companies out there that are going to require it. And uh, pretty sure that the Supreme Court has not done anything on the one about healthcare workers. Uh, you know, that was divided into two with private sector. And I think that those are still going to go into effect. But once again, we will not be that enforcement mechanism. Well, let's talk then if we could a bit about what it is your area of expertise does hold an umbrella over. What all do you guys do? Well, I always say we're the, we're the safety and wage uh, industry, you know, are the uh, implementer in the state. And most people aren't aware. Before I ran for office, I would have assumed that Department of Labor was probably a lot of union, non-union issues. Mm -hmm. Not true. The vast majority of what we do is safety for citizens and safety for the workforce. So we check a lot of things that people wouldn't be aware of to keep citizens safe. We check public access elevators and escalators. We check amusement park rides. We check high pressure hot water heaters and boilers. Uh, we check uh, everybody that does compressed natural gas vehicle conversions, asbestos abatement, any project that needs that to find properly certified people on that type of removal for health and safety reasons. Uh, we educate on child labor laws. We make sure that anybody that worked for an Oklahoma business and did not receive their wages they can come to us and we have administrative law judges that come in twice a month and we will litigate those cases for free to make sure they receive their wages owed from an Oklahoma employer. And then that program I mentioned before, our SHARP certification, which is a wonderful program. Everybody deserves to go to a place of safety when they work. You don't want to send people into dangerous situations when they're trying to make a living. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that one is highly utilized all across the state. And it's for, like I said, usually small businesses that can't afford to hire and keep on staff a full-time safety consultant. So we can kind of fill that void. And, uh, and that's a lot of what we do. Now, we also do a lot of reporting and statistical information on uh, labor statistics. So I've been having a lot of calls recently about what's going on with why we can't find people to work in the workforce. And we have some good data on those kind of things. What are the critical occupation shortages and why are we having these problems, for instance, in the service industry? Well, let's talk about that. Why are we having these shortages? Well, I think that there's an answer that most people have not considered. Um, very rarely does a new industry pop up overnight in your state. Most people have everything from accountants to farms to businesses to uh, hospitals, but we did not have a legal medical marijuana industry until three years ago in 2018 when that passed by initiative mm -hmm. petition on the state ballot. In 2019, it took effect. But remember, this is the same time that COVID's ramping up. So everybody's seeing these labor shortages and they're assuming everybody's either taking an unemployment check or they left because of fear of safety, those two kind of things. But during that time, the uh, medical marijuana group at, under the health department was licensing people in their three areas, which is grow houses, 
uh, processing facilities or dispensaries. Mm-hmm. Now that industry employs 45,000 people in Oklahoma. 98%, I would say, of those people were already here. Now, some of the people that may have come in that uh, started a business, bought the land, maybe some highly trained professionals in horticulture or chemistry for some of the processing facilities or the grows, but the vast majority were people that were sucked out like a vacuum in all 77 counties to go work in dispensaries and grow houses because the average starting wage is 12 to $15 an hour, and it doesn't take high levels of education. So wow. when you take into account that they were probably working at minimum wage jobs in the seven, eight dollar mm-hmm. range, mm-hmm. it was a natural fit for them to find something where they could make more money without more training for a lot of those types of jobs. Now, there are highly trained jobs, like I said, per- particularly in the horticulture end and in the chemistry end, but the vast majority are more of that service industry. So it basically vacuumed them out. The second thing that I think has been a huge factor on, particularly in this area, is is the minimum wage. It's the longest we have gone in U.S. history without raising the federal minimum wage. And whether we would like to believe that people work for philanthropy or fun, it's not true. They work to get a paycheck and pay the bills. And it's very difficult to make a living and be able to afford a car payment and an apartment rent with minimum wage. Now, a lot of businesses have taken care of that on their own. You know, Hobby Lobby now starts their minimum wage, eighteen fifty. I think that on cue is like $15. But we're going to have to see businesses value employees more in labor. You're not going to be able to get away probably with keeping people at what that mandated federal minimum is. And the third thing is child care. We've had a huge shortage of child care come about during COVID. Same way, a lot of the people, particularly in rural counties, were uh, your grandmothers. Uh, they were the older generation that they could watch four or five kids and get certified. And they were not they were scared to do that because of health mm-hmm. and safety mm-hmm. reasons. We also lost a lot of the people that did this with COVID. Um, there's very few chains that do things in the 75 rural counties. It may not be as much of a problem in Oklahoma County or Tulsa County, but to find childcare in Hobart or Woodward or Altus is a different game. Uh, we've got some great stats on it, but we have true child care deserts now is what I call them, where there will be just a tiny percentage of slots for women that have children, you know, and that's in Oklahoma being a patriarchal, the woman is the, is the one that tends to do the child care more. If, to be totally honest, if I was talking to you and we lived in Boston or Seattle, we would see as many men as women, that that was an issue, but here it tends to fall on mothers and young mothers. So even at the Department of Labor, we noted that that was the ones we had the most difficulty in retaining during COVID because they had kids home on a Chromebook when they were quarantined from school or they couldn't find daycare, their child care centers closed. So I'm really hoping that some of those federal ARPA dollars, which are the federal relief dollars under the Biden administration, CARES dollars was under Trump. I'm hoping a lot of those may be spent on things like like subsidized childcare across the state because we truly have that problem in that affects so much yeah. women, probably 18 to 40. And it's needed now more than ever. Uh, yes. it, it seems to me like if, if I'm hearing you correctly, your office is virtually nonpartisan. Right. It really is. And, you know, I think in the past, people didn't think that. Now, I will tell you this prior to right to work, And we all remember that was a huge campaign before I was in politics. I was in the private sector, then selling truck parts in Tuttle, Oklahoma. But right to work changed a lot of things with that. When it passed as a ballot initiative, what that basically meant was is that it didn't really matter if you were union or non-union. We were not showing preferences. And at the Department of Labor, it makes no difference to us if someone is unionized or not unionized. Mm -hmm. I will give you an interesting stat. uh, Being such a red state, a lot of times people assume that union members are all uh, Democrats. That's not true. I believe about 70% of the AFL-CIO's numbers of of, uh, union people in Oklahoma are Republicans. Just kind of an interesting anomaly that people, you know, that's changed over the years. But we have union and non-union members on all of our boards, and we show no discretion or notice uh, of either way on that. There have to be statistics that come by you, cross your desk, passed on to you day on a daily basis that absolutely caused you to arch an eyebrow. 
Right. And a lot of the things we see are what are the jobs in Oklahoma that we have critical shortages in? And in Oklahoma, we're doing real well in what I call the middle ground, which is the accountants, the bankers, the those kind of things. But down on this end in the construction trades, things like plumbers, electricians, we have huge shortages that can be correlated back to 20, 25 years ago when everybody decided every kid should go to college. And we discontinued things like shop classes. Instead, mandating that you had to have four years of science and four years of math and all these things that would get you into college. Mm -hmm. But by giving that avenue where kids sometimes found something they were really good at and they could get their occupational license and be entrepreneurial, we've kind of done a disservice to all of those uh, jobs. And we've got to do some ramping up of getting back people into being licensed electricians and plumbers. On the opposite end, we don't have enough engineers, teachers, or medical professionals. And we don't have enough people who can frame houses as well. Absolutely. So we need to have a better job being done by high schools and career techs in pushing young people into the jobs that will be lucrative for them, but have the occupational shortage needs. And that's where we seem to have that disconnect and have kids still going to college for a letters degree that could go be an apprentice for no cost in plumbing and start at 60,000 in two or three years when they're totally licensed, they're making money the whole time and there's nothing to pay back like a student loan. And that's an honorable profession that you can be very successful and ask Mark Wayne Mullins, our congressman, who you is do, a licensed plumber. You know, you there, there are certain there things we've time, got to push. There was a time that only welders could pull that kind of cash. Yes, but now they those jobs can be very lucrative mm-hmm. and very entrepreneurial. So we have to do a better job of coordinating with uh, the generation going into our next job holders. Okay. Commissioner, before we let you go, we got less than a minute. Uh, Doggone, it's gone fast. Uh, If you could, could you point us all in the direction of how we should be thinking in terms of labor in the state? You just touched on some of it. What are other areas that folks need to think toward uh, because it's going to be the coming thing eventually? I think that we have to do a different job as business owners and HR directors than we used to in that people used to go for the gold watch. Now our younger generations change jobs every two to three years. We're going to have to do things that make our workplaces more friendly to wanting to stay. And that may mean better wages. That may be working with them on better benefits. It may be helping them with childcare. Uh, whatever it is, I think we're going to have to assume that we have to do more to keep them in our jobs. State uh, Labor Commissioner Leslie Leslie Osborne, I want to thank you for taking time to visit with us. We are completely out of time. Next time you have some more time, throw it our way and let's get back together. It's a deal. And thanks for having me. I appreciate it. All right. We'll see you next time. Thank you for joining us, folks. We'll see you next time.